Okay, I think we are live. Um, so welcome, Jacob. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, uh, thank you for spending your afternoon with us talking about a favorite topic of mine, which is model risk management. Uh, I remember the first model I validated a really long time ago. And um, it was kind of interesting. We did not have a formal model risk management function at that point. And uh, we were a little bit scared about what we can say to the developers who are the kings of building the models and can we question their ability of building their models. And fast forward uh, the financial crisis and now you know, 13 years later, everybody is talking about AI risk and model risk management and uh, models are here to stay. And not only do we have the traditional statistical models, we have all the fun models and the whole spectrum of um, automatic machine learning models, natural language processing models, reinforcement learning models, supervised, unsupervised uh, AI models. So uh, we have a whole spectrum of models to choose from. And uh, uh, the designation and the profession of model risk management has also evolved significantly. And you have the pleasure and the responsibility, um, I don't know if you would call it the burden, of kind of managing and reining all these aspects within your organization at Regions Bank. Um, and um, uh, we would look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, people who are dialing in from throughout the globe. Uh, this is the Quant University Summer School 2021. Uh, we've been hosting uh, uh, many courses and educational sessions for the last year uh, through this online medium to bring in top leaders, experts, people who have uh, not only built in frameworks, but also experience operationalizing these frameworks in an enterprise setting. And so in the last uh, 47 sessions, I hope people who are coming in again and again to our continuous sessions, we've been able to kind of you know, share that whole perspective from multiple disciplines. And um, today, uh, we, as I mentioned, Jacob uh, from Regions Bank is gonna be presenting about modernizing uh, model risk management. And um, uh, this is a part of the Quant University Summer School Series. We've been posting these sessions every Tuesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, next week, we will be taking a break. You know, we will need a summer, uh, a small summer vacation, and I'll be somewhere in the mountains. Uh, hopefully, there's no internet there because I, um, I've been addicted to my phone and I keep checking my messages. So I'm going to go to a place where I cannot access the internet. And the week after that, uh, we are going to come back and we have two more sessions. One that uh, President and I are talking about explainable AI and another one on uh, ML exchange. So all those are available. So let me share my screen for people to go in and register. Um, so it's on the Quant University Summer School webpage. And uh, you can just go to Q Summer School 2021 dot slash dot com and register and you'll get invites to these sessions. But also we have uh, more courses coming up in the summer session um, and also in the fall session, we've been trying to like you know, put together courses focused on uh, AI, machine learning, model risk management. And if you're interested in any of these courses, feel free to register. We are offering these in partnership with Premier. And in addition to that, uh, we have been hosting, as I mentioned, multiple uh, guest lectures. So feel free to just check those. And uh, we would love to see you again uh, in the future. And in today's session, so this is a topic we have been discussing for a long time uh, through multiple channels. Jacob and I and uh, many others have been looking at this whole notion of uh, what does it mean to bring in model risk management when you're talking about AI and machine learning models. And, um, uh, I, after hearing all the work regions have been doing, so we thought uh, we would invite um, uh, Jacob to talk about, you know, how do you actually incorporate all these aspects into modern model risk management? And for people who don't know Jacob, uh, Jacob heads model risk management and validation within Regions Bank, and uh, he's been serving this role since uh, May of 2014. Uh, many of you know Jacob uh, because of his prolific uh, thinking and also uh, the various uh, presentations he has done at multiple industry forums, uh, talking about uh, various best practices and uh, ways in which you can operationalize uh, machine learning and uh, model risk management within a financial organization setting. <clears throat> and also, um, you know, region, uh, in addition to regions, uh, Jacob has had past experience with PNC Bank, 
FreeMac and uh, Genesis Analytics. And uh, he's also been recently nominated by the Regions Bank and selected by the Brigham, uh, Birmingham uh, Business Journal uh, as a top 40 under 40 professional. So uh, I would never have known that uh, Jacob Hanji told me, you know, I would have said like it would be like 30 under 30 uh, <laughs> <laughs> setting. So um, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Jacob to the stage. Um, give me one second, Jacob. I can let you share the screen. So the stage is all yours. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you for having me, Sri. I'm excited to be here and I'd be happy to come in the future to follow up on other related topics on uh, modernizing model risk or AI risk and so forth. Um, so again, as Sri mentioned, I've been in kind of the financial services area for about 16, 17 years now. My first uh, six years were in model development. Uh, then I worked a few years in credit review, and now I've been in model risk since then, running model risk here at Regions for the past uh, seven years. Um, if you have questions, definitely feel free to jump in uh, with questions. Love this to be a conversation. Um, so for us at Regions, as in the industry, we're continuing to think through how can we transform model risk? As we see more and more models are being developed uh, at our firm and the firm is also buying more and more models, how can you keep up? And first I just wanna say before I go any further that the views I'm gonna share today are mine and they're only intended for information purposes and they're not formal opinions of nor binding on Regions Bank or its parent company, Regions Financial Corporation. Um, so just to clarify, these are my views and not necessarily those of the financial institution. So at Regions, we've gone through a journey to think through how can we speed up our validation? How can we make the work more transparent? How can we work, make the work more value added? And how can we, where possible, automate aspects of model risk? And by automation, this is, you know, automating 25 to 30% of model validation activities. It's, it's not automating all of it. So, the goal is to take an activity, a validation that might normally take you 100 hours, to get that down to a, um, a 75 hours or 70 hours. That, that is the goal. And that really adds up when we think about our inventory of models, which is growing at about 25% per year. If we can get activities, you know, 500 hour uh, full validation activities down to 380, 390, uh, I think we'll be in good shape. And, and that's really what we're talking about here. So I just want to clarify that by automating, um, that's automating aspects of model validation. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Great. So as we can see here, um, we're really going to talk about two things. One is modernizing model risk. You can't modernize model risk without uh, upskilling the model developers, and a lot of that's a partnership. And so really working with model developers because we'll get the best uh, um, returns on our efforts on transforming aspects of model risk and developing automated validation libraries and some automated enterprise model monitoring and so forth, the more adoption that you have for model developers. And we want to kind of hold their hands and work with them closely uh, as they adopt. And, you know, like uh, most firms, you have brilliant people in model development, brilliant people in model risk, and the more they can uh, work together better, it's great. And model risk, only 11% of the findings we give are documentation findings. So again, only 11% are what you call documentation findings. The other 89% of their findings are actual errors with the models, problems with the models, errors with the models, error with the code, error with the conceptual soundness, errors with overfitting, errors with performance, uh, errors with uh, ongoing monitoring, errors with threshold, threshold breaches. So we talk about model risk, every firm's different, but for us, a small share, 11%, some years it's 12%, some years it's 10%, but, you know, uh, in terms of those that are actually documentation issues. So it's important to step back and see where you are uh, in model risk and how your model developers are doing. All right. So first, you need to set a vision for your model risk. And for us, we set a vision. We want to be transparent, consistent, risk-based, collaborative, a talent incubator, and automated. So I think this is a really, before you start doing anything, you really want to step back and say, what is your goal? What is your vision, right? And for us, we really do want to be um, transparent and consistent and so forth. And what do our validations want to look like? We want to be risk-based. We don't want to boil the ocean. We want to be value-added and so forth. Then, and maybe I'm going to share my screen on this other screen. One second, let me try something else. 
Let's do this. Let's try share my screen this way. And I can, all right, that work? Can you still see my screen? Yes, okay, good. So that's even better for me. Second, we want to support innovation, right? Model risk, I think, is probably one of the biggest supporters of innovation here at Regions Bank. And in the industry, you got to be careful, right? Is model risk the death of innovation or is it a supporter of innovation? And for us here at Regions, it is a supporter of innovation. We support where practical and enable the use of innovative modeling, support the strategy of innovating with digital and data. Um, this helps us uh, kind of provide more effective challenge, but also helps us um, ensure that model development is being done in a safe and sound way. And of course, automated application of policies and standards. So we set goals for the year. We want our work to be timely. We want to get a variety of things done. We want to maintaining and continuously improving core competencies on our team, continue to develop people's machine learning skills and so forth. Then we think for, okay, the whole team's evolving. How is model risk evolved? So these are my job requirements uh, today versus my job requirements 10 years ago. And so the head of model risk has really evolved. 10 years ago, you weren't chairing the head of a model governance committee. Now you are. 10 years ago, you weren't really that critical. You were important, but not really that critical beyond CCAR. Now, you know, capital planning is only 15% of what we do. 85% of the models at most financial institutions are not capital planning. Again, 85%, and it varies in different surveys, sometimes 80, sometimes it's 87. But, you know, at most financial institutions, over 80% of all models, over 80% of all hours, over all 80% of most validators are not on capital planning. Uh, they're working on fraud models and underwriting models and marketing models and so forth. Significant on a variety of tools, leads AI risk management at regions, like most firms, AI risk management is part of model risk management. The head of AI risk management reports to me, uh, and that's an important aspect of our bank, especially as we think through ethical AI. As we talk through more later today, we'll talk through how strong model risk really ensures strong AI risk and how you need to partner with others. And I'd be happy to come back uh, in a future event to really dive in on AI risk management, which is a key uh, subset of model risk. And so on and so forth. There's a variety of things that model risk leaders have to do. So then the team has to continuously upskill as well. Um, oh, is that a question in the question box? How did you achieve such a high quality model development documentation culture if relevant validation findings are around 11%. I think MRI modernization largely hinges on transparent, consistent, strong documentation. Great, now, that's a great question. So for us, I think we're very clear with model owners that the bank uh, has no appetite for black box. Uh, the bank, we really wanna make sure that we're, we're managing risk well. Banks take risk, but we really wanna make sure we're managing risk and we're aware of risks. In model documentation, whether it's automated documentation you use and having it all in Confluence or Wikipedia, or it's traditional model documentation in Microsoft Word, or, you know, um, we really encourage good documentation. It helps the model developers. I think the one important thing is the model development leaders have really embraced it. It helps them with key person dependencies. If somebody quits, it's not a big deal. Somebody else can follow up on the documentation. Um, I know, you know, our markdown is very popular here. Uh, people use Jupyter Notebooks. I think it's just a part of the culture here that as you're developing models, you're keeping track, you're documenting your variable choices, you're documenting your choices on, um, on the conceptual soundness, you're documenting your choices on data, you're documenting your choices on how you're uh, deciding on missing data. And so I think there's a culture here of, uh, of using modern tools for documentation. Um, and you know everyone puts all their, their code in Bitbucket, like in a Git environment. There's just an environment here where you keep track of your work. But to your point, yeah. Only 11% of our issues are documentation findings, so we've been very fortunate that our model developers uh, do um, appropriately uh, keep track of their work and, and are pretty efficient with it. All right, so model developers and validators have to develop different skills here, some of the expertise in model risk. Our team is strong on machine learning, they're strong on data, they're strong on architecture, strong on DevOps and automation, and we're continuing to upskill here. So to modernize model risk, first you start with a vision, you set out your priorities, you figure out what skill, what responsibilities model risk really takes on and what's not, and then you figure out, okay, what skills does your team need so you can validate the models of the future? 
and that'll tie in with automation. So now when we think about automation, we like to think through it as kind of uh, products. So there's really six products. Uh, well, any you could do it different ways, but the way we see it at Regions is there are six products. One is reusable test code. That's kind of like a validation library. Model developers, when they build models, they would save the test there. So if a model developer needs to have an AUC test, they shouldn't be writing a custom uh, area under the curve test from scratch. There's a reusable test code. There's a validation library that they can pull from. Um, whether model aiders wrote it or model developers wrote it or you got it from open source and others wrote it or you bought, bought the code from somewhere else, that there should be reusable test code that developers and validators can do. And that'll help support objective one, which is automated testing. So I'm looking at the, the table on the right side of the screen. So that's important. As validators build models, sorry, as validators validate models and developers build models, as you're writing tests, whether it's binary classifier tests or whatever tests you're writing, you're saving it in a automated testing library. Now you can build that kind of infrastructure yourself, the architecture to have that library, you can buy it from lots of vendors, whatever you want. But I think that's really the most important product for us. It facilitates uh, um, more repeatable monitoring, but really helps facilitate more automated testing. Um, there's some other wins that so you think of kind of double digit return on our benefits. Uh, we think using a validation library for tests will take a, a 100 hour validation down to an 88 hour validation, right? So we do think that'll save about 12% of a validation's time if validators do not have to write their own tests. So validators don't have to write their own tests. They don't have to write their own code there. They can pull from a library, which has hundreds of tests to choose from for different categories, whether you're doing conceptual soundness testing or very statistical testing or back testing. Um, that code's already pre-written. From our estimates, and I think these are conservative estimates, a task, uh, whether it's a 300 or 400 or 500 hour validation, will we'll take down about 12% of the hours. Uh, enterprise monitoring dashboard, that's something you can work on. Automated documentation, it helps a lot. So think of a validation report, it's kind of pre-written. They'll say the model has a KS of X or an AUC of Y or a PSI of Z. It is below or above the threshold, that's all pre-written. Um, uh, and then there's open space or highlighted space in yellow where your human model validator can type in and she can type in any of her kind of opinions and, and concerns that she's seeing with the model. But the basic uh, statistics um, will already be pre-populated. We think that'll that'll save another 15%. Um, same with some annual review automation and so forth. So let me pause if there's any questions in the Q&A. All right. So this slide, and definitely feel free to take this home with you and work with it. This is slide eight. This is MRM automation. Again, this is you're not automating all of model risk. All of model risk is a, can be a, a um, a bespoke process. There's a lot of thinking going on, a lot of conceptual challenge, uh, conceptual soundness challenge, a lot of challenging of the use of the model. You know, oh, we're using it in for this geography. Was the model built for that geography? You know, it, it's a real, uh, you spend a lot of time kind of challenging, oh, the model was not built for rural homes in the training data set. I have to give you, but now you're using it for rural homes or, or whatever it might be. So there is still a lot, you can't automate it all. You can't automate away half of it, but you can automate in a regulated environment like a bank, you can you can automate aspects. Um, so on the left, I mentioned a testing library, mentioned annual reviews, initial annual reviews automated on new model development, significant change reviews automated, and then ongoing monitoring automation. So I'll go to the next slide. All right, so that's how, so this is slide eight, and. I can always have a follow-up. I have uh, 40 slides that just go deeper into what is slide eight, uh, but this is a summary, I believe time for questions. But um, it's important to think through what is your vision for automation. So for us, what does it mean? We have six categories of products. What are our objectives for automation? Automated testing, policy is code. So you, someone doesn't have to read through hundreds and hundreds of pages of Word documents or PowerPoints on what they're allowed to do when they're building their models, it already pops up that, okay, you have to do back testing here. It already pops up what the thresholds are. If it's a consumer credit model, you have to do additional testing on uh, unfairness. If it's a commercial credit model, maybe there's different standards. If it's a AML model or it's a market risk model, so the policy is code, but 
the more and more you can get validators, model developers rather, away from reading hundreds of pages of, of Word documents or PDFs and getting all those requirements embedded in the model development platform, embedded in your data science platform, all the expectations that you have for data scientists, all the expectations you have for model developers, whether it's on saving data, whether it's on testing, whether it's on benchmarking, whether it's on um, descriptive statistics, whether it's on fairness, whether it's on um, you know, uh, you know, attribution analysis, the more you can embed that within your platform where you build the models, embed that within your data science platform, that's a win for model developers and it's also a win for model risk. And then you hopefully have less errors because it's, it's a bit like doing TurboTax. You can just do your old taxes your traditional way and then read the tax code or you can build TurboTax when you go through and it says, you know, are you blind? No, you move on. Are you blind? Yes. Okay. Were you blind through a war? Yes or no. And then you, it automatically directs you towards what tax deduction you get there and it asks sub questions because you've asked yes or no. That is also part of the automated um, aspects of a kind of policy of the code, the more you can have kind of automated triggers. Uh, Jacob, can I ask you a question there? So yeah. uh, I've seen a couple of different approaches and some companies, they go with a testing first approach wherein the test suite is first designed before the models are actually even developed. That way the developers know what the scope of testing is and what would the validators be looking for when they build out their uh, you know, case for whether the model is robust enough or not. Um, or sometimes I've seen you know, uh, entities which build the models and then hand it over to the MRM teams. And the MRM teams, they've you know, independently built their test suites and start working on it. So uh, what are the pros and cons of both approaches and what approach have you guys chosen? Yeah, great question. So there are expectations of model developers. What, are the, what testing does the first line have to do? And we socialize those. We have lots of trainings. We have trainings even next Monday with our third annual data science day, we have data 360, we have regions analytics institute, we have lunch and learns, we have quant summits, post right there. <laughs> we have lots of training for model developers on what they need to do. And of course there's different testing, a capital markets model is gonna have a different testing than a market risk model, which will have different testing than a uh, consumer underwriting model. So we do make sure that we have uh, those expectations clearly out there. The expectations of a machine learning model can be different than a classical uh, statistical regression model. So we really try to make sure that in most cases, the testings are known before you build the model. There's a test that you have to run or known, the test that we're gonna run, you'll know, and it's all there. It's all there on our, our share drive. It's all there on our Confluence pages. It's all there in our data science uh, platform. And then when model developers are building their models, they know what's expected of them and they know it's expect, what we expect of them, and they know what we're gonna do. And then also, if they think of new ideas, best practices on tests, they can build those tests, put in those tests. We can then socialize those tests, um, and even beyond test practices. You know, Five years ago, 20, yeah, 2016 was the first time anyone here saved any model to, uh, to a Git environment, to Bitbucket. Great, that was leading practice. So when we saw that, we celebrated that, and then in 2017, we celebrated it more and say, hey, look at these groups giving best practices. We then put it into our pop procedures as best practices. And these are best practices. And so in 2017, if you didn't save your code in a Bitbucket environment, you didn't get a finding. You just got a note that you're not following best practice. Then by 2018, we put it as a standard practice, as a standard of model development. And then by 2018 forward, if you're saving your code, not in the Bitbucket environment, you get a finding. So a lot of what model developers do, we end up learning uh, and then we end up creating as best practices and then make standard practices and then get findings. So in short, model developers know what they have to do. Model developers know what we have to do and model developers are encouraged to go above and beyond and even come up with other uh, better practices. How do you ensure completeness and accuracy of your model inventory? Do you rely on a voluntary attestation by model owners, do you use automated search utility? It's a great question. So for us, um, so let me say, what, answer it this way. At Regions, um, our leading data scientists, our leading model developers have all previously worked in Regions model risk management. Our head of data science, Chun Shiro's PhD, 
worked for five years in model risk. Now she's the head of data science. Um, our head of model platforms, Daniel Stahl, he's a manager. He used to work in model risk for many years, including as an analyst and as a manager. You know, and as you go throughout the bank, you have more and more of these model developers and model owners that have previously worked in model risk. So they know the expectations from their time here. Um, so that's really important. So when we think about model inventory, they're aware of those practices. That helps. So we have 27 alumni. So 27 people at Regions today used to work in model risk, whether it's the Arena who runs LIBOR, or it's Elizabeth who's a data scientist and in internal audit, or, you know, or it's Dwight who's in the corporate bank and so on and so forth, or Aaron who's in technology. We have um, operation and technology. You have so many alumni that know that process. The alumni help. Second, we spend lots of time socializing the expectations. All the executives get a quarterly email about their existing inventory, about the definition of a model, for that, uh, them to tell us everything they're doing. We have close partnerships with third-party risk management. They keep us in the loop. We have close parties, partnerships with procurement. You know, 50% of all models are vendor models. We learn about it through partnerships with third-party risk management, with procurement, with legal, a lot of contract negotiations, if the, you know, the vendor is giving us developmental evidence, if they're not, you know, and so forth. We attend, uh, we have regular touch points with executives, you know, so my direct reports will meet with the heads, the heads of market risk and credit risk on a quarterly basis. We go through their inventories um, to discuss their upcoming strategies. We serve on a variety of committees. You know, we serve on capital market committees and market risk committees and capital market committees and loss forecasting committees and fraud committees and consumer scorecard credit working groups. And, you know, so we have all that exposure. So there's a lot. There's the alumni, there's the socialization, there's the quarterly emails, there's quarterly meetings, in some cases monthly meetings. Um, and so for us, we feel really, really comfortable. Um, Naira with a new initiative risk assessment, all these things, we are on the distribution of everything. We're on the distribution of third party, we're on the distribution of new initiatives. We have uh, alumni from ours are in strategic planning and we're part of that process. So model risk has a seat at the table on all these decisions on should we use this model? Should we not use this model? Should we buy this from a vendor? Should we not buy this from a vendor? And so for us, um, I think we're in a really good spot that everyone knows about. Most people know about model risk. We're always socializing it. Executives really take this seriously. You know, when we speak at the executive leadership team meeting, they take it serious. CEO takes it seriously that we don't want any uh, unvalidated models of the bank. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone's aware of, of how to appropriately be transparent with their models. We celebrate that transparency. So uh, we don't really use too many automated search utilities. We can if we think there's a risk, but right now we feel uh, really good. Um, plus, it's pretty easy to just go in the bit bucket and see what everyone's building uh, and be like, oh, what's going on? That's being built. Um, and then, you know, you can follow up with the model owner. So I think um, we're, we're in a really good spot right now on inventory. But we're always looking for better options too. That was a question there in inventory. All right, so next is coaching model developers. On the left are probably what your model development teams did, uh, you know, in, in 2016 or 17 or 2018. Uh, and now on the right is hopefully what all your model development teams are doing in 2021 and how model risk tries to partner with that. So in the old days, monitoring Programs are manual, custom, cannot easily be aggregated. Now monitoring programs, hopefully at your firm, are templated, are automated, and can be aggregated. In the past, your model developers probably did not follow software development best practices. They probably, they didn't use modularization. They didn't have source version control. They didn't do unit testing. They didn't do integration testing in the past. Um, they probably didn't have a production pipeline with technology controls um, and so forth. Now, hopefully at most firms, your model developers are following software development best practices, um, which helps them with code updates, making it easier, easier to track, um, and, and so forth. So in each case, model risk partners um, with the model developers to help them kind of more and more modernize their work. And that helps us, going back to this slide, speed up our work, the more in a modern environment, a controlled environment, the code is. If the code is hidden on someone's hard drive, we can't run automated tests on it. Uh, if it's in Bitbucket, we can. Same thing, we try to help model developers understand the appropriate pipeline for modeling, kind of, uh, of how you would build models, where the, um, uh, the data comes, to our systems, to a data lake, to data wrangling, to a feature store. We kind of work with them on, on model monitoring. 
you know, model engineering and exploratory data analysis, model valuation, model promotion, model and production, and we work with them on production monitoring. So we really try to um, help the lines of business know um, and, and model developers know kind of our expectations for best practices on how you have data pipelines, how you have model pipelines, and how you have software development pipelines. That helps speeds up our work. So we can, the speed of model risk modernization is contingent on the speed of model development modernization. So Jacob, is this workflow different from um, for traditional models or do you have separate process for traditional models and separate ones for machine learning or data science based models? It's similar. It's a very similar approach. Um, yeah, so I was going to pull something up here. Um, yeah, it's a very um, similar approach. Okay. And also, when you, when you talk about Bitbucket, do you have like established CI, CD kinds of processes or do you, um, do you have specific workflows you initiate to validate these tests? More on the latter. And, and we're, um, for us, it's really been helpful as we've been able to partner with model, uh, sorry, with the IT department. And really, how, what is the software engineers doing in IT, the non-modeling, and how can we bring those same expectations, those same standards to, um, to modeling? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think there's also another question Cheryl was asking, does the asset management industry use this type of modeling practice too? What again? Say it again. Uh, does the asset management industry use this type of modeling practice too? Well, yeah, I don't know. And yeah, oh, uh, I'm not in, yeah, I'm not too close to the asset management industry, but I'd imagine they uh, most likely. I mean, it depends. I mean, at least some of the experience I've had depends on the use case. I think if you're doing like a decision support system, leveraging NLP or some other, you know, you're doing some signal analysis, probably it's going to be a similar workflow uh, with respect to data. All right. And here's another visual that helps too. It's the same as the last slide, but just kind of shows it in a linear. Function. Can you guys still see my screen? Yes. And you see the straight line. So this is just the same as before. You can kind of see where Bitbucket fits in and where the data fits in. So, you know, hopefully this is to so the asset manager. I imagine you would model just like this. Data comes in, you do your data analysis, model training, um, keep track of that in Jupyter Notebook. The results go back into the data lake. You build your equation or your function. You see, build your model, if you will. You do monitoring. You do a variety of tests. The tests are all written in your Bitbucket environment. Results of the tests go back out the data lake. You do some reporting, some partially automated validation of significant changes, and then it all goes into a uh, you know Wikipedia type environment for your documentation. You produce an API documentation. So that's kind of a standard um, process, I'd imagine. And these are our expectations for developers. Um, you know, this is kind of the language we share. Templates reduce reliance on reading hundreds of pages of policy. You know, just kind of our expectations. And um, we'll be putting all these slides uh, on Q Academy, so you can, you know, digest it. Uh, right. I know it's uh, going to be hard to kind of get through all the slides. In right, the, right. The thought setting, but. Uh, We'll be sharing all the slides later. Great. All right, back to the core slides. Um, next, here we go, uh, slide 12, 2021 changes to model owners. As I mentioned earlier, best practices become expectations. So we write findings um, to, to help move model developers towards the more modern and agile development practices. You know, models have to develop in centralized data platform. MR is developing a centralized model monitoring standard. Automation activities uh, are just trying to help. We're just trying to help set clear expectations. Oh, I have this slide already in here. Um, trying to help people know what's expected of them. So we try to make sure we're socializing all our uh, modernization. I showed the slide earlier. I showed this slide earlier. And then there's like an appendix. So I can go through the appendix, but I'm uh, happy to take more questions. There was a question about uh, does your company use an agile approach for model risk management? Um, and, uh, yes. 
for us, yeah, we definitely have model developers that, that use a kind of um, minimal valuable product, and we work with them on kind of having um, parallel validations or agile validations. So when we do see model developers take an agile approach, we do want to make sure that there are some constraints because uh, uh, maybe the model is only being used in pilot, it's only be using on some customers, there's some manual overrides, depends on, on the use. But yes, we've had some good experiences with model developers adapt, uh, adopting more of an agile framework. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, I think um, I you know, uh, would love to kind of um, you know, uh, see if you can talk a little bit about the framework you shared with me, Jacob, uh, the grid, and how do you kind of see machine learning? Oh, right. So within models, that's a great point. We have a, um, an environment where we think about classification of models. So we have models um, that are kind of tier one or high risk, you know, tier two, tier three, tier four. So high risk, moderate risk, low risk, very low risk. And that's informed by the importance of the model and importance, we consider materiality, we consider reliance, we consider exposure, we consider the, the size of the portfolio or the amount of loans it touches, we consider its criticality, um, we consider uh, you know, the overall importance of the model, that's on one axis. The other axis is the uncertainty, right? And that includes the model methodology. And for us, models with more complex methodologies, uh, including more machine learning models and AI, will end up with a higher uncertainty rating. And so models with a high importance rating, again, which is criticality and, and dollar size and materiality, that, that's what we call importance, versus uncertainty, those that are in the highest, we do more in-depth work and do more frequent work. So we are definitely um, a group that, that tries to make our sure our work is risk-based. And so therefore, more machine learning models will end up with higher uncertainty ratings, therefore end up with higher classification ratings, and then it'll end up with us doing more in-depth testing and more frequent testing. Very nice. And also, you mentioned briefly about vendor models. Um, about do you which model? have about vendor models, models you source from different vendors? Oh, vendor models. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, do you set expectations for them on you know what, especially with machine learning models, that they should have you know you know this level of transparency or this level of yes. uh, uh, disclosures yes. they should be doing? And also, right. does the requirements change when it comes down to someone offering you a model as a service, like a black box, just an API, right. versus they actually giving you the model parameters and the model actual the actual models? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's a that's an ongoing conversation. That's an evolving dialogue. There's no right answer, but for us, yes, we have the same expectation. I shouldn't say same. That 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 might be a little strong. We have very similar expectations for vendor models as we do for in-house developed models. You know, we have zero appetite for black box models. We need to make sure that if we're making decisions or taking on credit risk or whatever it might be related to a vendor's models, there's a lot of risk there. So take it, for example, I'll use some examples. Think about a vendor model has an automated valuation model and the bank, a bank is considering it to help speed up uh, faster underwriting, say for home equity. Mm -hmm. Well, we ask them what's in the training data set. If, you're not, if you don't have access to the training data set, we will not use the AVM. And most banks, most banks will not use an automated valuation model unless they know it's in the training data set. So why, let me give an example of why you need to know it's in the training data set. You get access to the training data set, you run it up against some publicly available um, uh, data, and you see that all the zip codes in the training data set are not in rural areas. They're not rural zip codes, they're in metropolitan areas. You say, wait a minute, the entire training data set is on single family, um, non-rural home. Wait a minute, I was planning on using this AVM to have to speed up our underwriting process for home equity in rural and non-rural homes. Uh, homes. And oh my goodness, will I, this model work on rural homes? And you'd say, well, maybe it won't, right? There's a lot of unique aspects about rural homes, more maybe sales to relatives, um, less homogeneity of the property, you know, mineral rights, all sorts of things that can, you know, come involved, different structures on the property and so forth. And so when you challenge the, the training data set and say, oh, there's no Native American uh, housing uh, in the training data set. There's no rural housing in the training data set. There's no manufactured houses in the training data set. 
There is no housing on military bases in the training data set. Oh, Puerto Rico, Guam, the United Virgin, United States uh, Virgin Islands are excluded from the training data set. You know, as you go more and more, you say, I need to know it's in the training data set. So, because otherwise it's not appropriate to use it on that population. So that's one aspect I would say is, to, is a, you, if you cannot have access to the training data set or at least some kind of metadata there, you have to be really careful in using it. I think the second story I'll give is, is to really understand your own data. So it's very common in the um, cybersecurity modeling space or the information technology modeling space or the customer authentication modeling space. You hear stories like this all the time. It goes like this. A vendor comes in and they say, oh my goodness, we can figure out if someone that's trying to log on to their bank account, if it's, a, if it's really them or not, if it's a bad actor, if it's a nefarious agent, you know, we can figure out if they're bad. We can figure out with, if usually your customer uses an Apple device and now the person's using an Android device. If usually they're using a subscription phone when they call in to your 1-800 number and now they're using prepaid. Or they usually use AT&T and now they're using Sprint or T-Mobile when they go to the app. Or they're usually uh, stationary when they call in or use the app and now they're moving at 60 miles an hour. Or usually there's no background noise and now there is, or usually the background noise is a certain thing. You know, all this information. And you say, wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. But this is where model risk really adds value. It's when model risk is in those conversations with the vendor initially. And it's model risk, it's line of business considering buying that model, and it's the vendor. Model risk says, wait a minute, do we save the data on our customer on what device they use? Do we save that as AT&T? Do we save that as Apple? Do we save the voice in the background? Do we save the customer's voice? Do we save if the customer is moving? If we don't save any of that, no matter how amazing the vendor model is to, for customer authentication, it, the model is built to work by comparing the, the action of the, of, the, of the customer or the potential customer um, of, versus the saved actions of, versus what's normal for the customer versus your baseline. If you're not saving your baseline, this vendor model, even if it's beautiful and it's built nicely, won't work because you don't have uh, the ingredients on your side. And so this is a common problem. Think about fraud models. Um, common problem. These work based on comparing the behavior of the customer versus their historical behavior. So I'll use a third example here that comes up. It came up a lot for fraud models over the last 18 months. If you go back two years ago and you looked at any vendor fraud model, say one that's designed to predict uh, transaction fraud, debit card transaction fraud, or credit card transaction fraud, the number one predictive variable for a fraud model, a fraud transaction model, with card present to card not present ratio. Meaning, if the customer historically used their card, their transactions are card present, and all of a sudden they switch to many card not present transactions, the model would flag the customer, or the transaction rather, as a fraudulent transaction, right? You're always using card present, and then all of a sudden card not present, boom, it flags it. Well, what happened in March of 20? 20, we had stay at home orders, safer at home orders, quarantining, people are more cautious. And people like my mother, who never, ever, ever used their credit card online before, all of a sudden was buying shoes online and buying clothing online and buying groceries online with card not present. Of course, her card was, was frozen and she couldn't use it for like three days because, of course, the model predicted that she was fraudulent, that it, there were fraudulent transactions. However, as we've learned in credit modeling, as we've learned, in market risk modeling, as we've learned in marketing, as we've learned in fraud, customer behavior changes. And here in this case, had we not known the, the, the functional form of the vendor model, had we not known the weighting of the variables, we would not, or any firm would not have been able to pick out and saying, oh, this model is not going to work because customer behavior has changed. So for us, I think the reason to challenge vendor models is not because of regulators or audit or whatever. It's because there's a lot of risk if it's built to work for your customers, if it's built to work with your data, does it take into consideration changing customer behavior? And whether the vendor is hyping their performance or they're accurately describing it, either way, you need to, well, you, you won't know that until you challenge the model, but so you always see implementation risk and implementation errors and models built for one thing and used somewhere else. And you know, documentation says, oh, the model includes Canadian customers and Canadian credit bureaus for your South Florida 
snowbird lending. And then you look at the data and you're like, there's no Canadians in here. None of the Canadian credit bureaus transfer. And so I think you've learned to, over the years, I think almost all model risk teams have learned to, even if there was no SR117, even if there were no regulators, you would still, for the safety of the bank and, the, and, and for the bank's you know, safety and soundness, you would still challenge the vendor models rigorously. Absolutely, this, this was excellent. I actually made a note of all the two examples. Um, I will I'll try to like uh, digest it and I'll probably have a couple more questions about that. Now, um, one thing which I was kind of thinking about this is, would it fall under model risk or would it be a process risk or some kind of an operational risk issue at this point? You know, when you may not have the right data sets or you may not uh, uh, have the right processes to even you know, incorporate these models into your work stream. So for us, that's model risk. We work very closely with operational risk, very, very closely. You know, uh, they sit on the same floor as us. Um, we work very closely with operational risk. And for us, that is a model risk if the, if that, if the developmental evidence isn't there. And that's why it's important that model risk is uh, part of the decision making on bringing on a vendor or not. Because you don't want to be in a spot where a vendor is brought on without model risk's opinion. And then you're, you're unfortunately agreed to a lot less developmental evidence, a lot less data, a lot less uh, transparency than you hoped for. So that's why, it's, uh, for us, you know, model risk is an operational risk when you think of kind of the Basel categories and so forth. But uh, yeah, model risk handles it, I think, at most financial institutions. Absolutely. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, the first example about, um, you know, potentially the data, the training data sets. Now, are vendors usually okay with sharing their training data sets or would they, would it suffice that they just give you like a training data profile? Uh, yeah, a profile can be fine, right? Just gotta make sure you're asking the right questions, right? So you don't mm -hmm. want to turn into a, you know, an Apple where, you know, the training data set for their face ID were mainly Caucasian faces and then mm -hmm. it doesn't perform well on individuals with darker skin. Like you don't want to run into that example. So even if you can't get the individual loans, you want to have the, the portfolio by what you're interested in. You know, if you're going to use the model for, you know, Native American reservation lending, you need to know if Native American homes are on your training data set, right? If you want to use it for uh, Canadians to buy second homes in Florida, we got to know if the Canadian credit history is going to be in the data, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think when you think about all these models, you know, who is this model built for? And am I using it for, the, uh, for that intended purpose, right? Am I, am I using a model that's designed to predict credit losses? Am I using that for fraud? Well, I, I don't think that's the best use, you know? So I think even if you just get a profile, that can be fine, but you really have to, before you ask anything from a vendor, you really have to step back and look at your policies, look at your procedures and say, why are we asking for this? What is the point? You know, I would like to think that in model risk, our associates are very creative. They're very risk-based. They're willing to challenge authority. I mean, in a way that what you do in model validation, you're, Constantly challenging authority. You're, you're failing EVP's models. You know, you're going to executives and giving them findings. But the same thing with our work. If we're asking for too much, you want the model risk associates to say, we don't really need all that. You know, and, and for us, as long as we're being risk-based, we're trying to make sure we have a mature and a healthy and an effective model risk team. We're catching errors. We're preventing the bank from unintended losses from poorly controlled or poorly performing models. As long as we're always stepping back and why are we here? We're not here to prevent MRAs or to prevent MRIAs or prevent audit issues. We're here so the bank doesn't have material losses from models. Mm -hmm. We're also here for fairness. We want to make sure we treat all our customers fairly. We're here to test model bias. We're here to test um, data bias. We're here to make sure that models perform well. And as long as it's kind of in our heart, it's not oh, because of this regulation or that regulation. Those regulations, of course, are important, but we're always really trying to do the right thing. I think that empowers the model validators to make the right choices as they go through this process. And similarly with the model developers. Absolutely, and I think that's a great segue to Ben's uh, question online. So how do you strike the balance between a model risk group giving advice during the development process and demonstrating independence of the model risk group? Uh, is it important to demonstrate independence? Yeah, I think our team is, yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a variety of ways you, so when I step back and assess our independence, you know, are we still giving strong findings? Yes. Our count of findings, are they going up? Yes. Are, are we finding errors? When we see issues, do we give them findings? Yes. 
And then I think that's the best way I kind of measure independence. We see errors, we get findings. Sometimes we find an error and they can fix it in an hour. Okay, great. So in the, in the validation report, when we go to send it out the next week, we can note, fine, we gave this finding and they closed it. It was a pre-implementation closed finding. Great, we give them credit. So I think you can build healthy relationships with the model developers. You can give them advice. You can give them coaching, give them guidance, and still maintain that level of independence. Independence is important. It ensures that we are incentivized to do rigorous work. We're incentivized and we see an error, we call it out. We see a poorly performing model, we call it out. We see a metric that's, that's calculated incorrectly, we point it out. We see thresholds that are you know, oddly moving, uh, we pull, we we pointed out. So as long as we're continuously incentivized to point out errors, that's really for us the holy grail of independence. When I see model developers and model validators getting lunch together, that's not a problem with independence. That's good. They're building relationships. When I see somebody um, from my team training others on how to use Python or how to convert code from SAS to Python or or teaching them how to use Bitbucket, that's great. We're 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 teaching them things, uh, but uh, we're still maintaining our independence. So I think um, as long as your heart's in the right place, uh, I think independence comes with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, what are your thoughts about uh, you know all the new tooling infrastructure which are coming outside? Because as I look at the ecosystem, so you have uh, an explainability platform, a monitoring platform, a fairness platform, so when you're sourcing tools for your organization, are you kind of looking at different tool chains and building bridges between these tool chains and setting up processes? Or is it more on the other side where you have established processes and you're kind of just integrating tools? And uh, what are your choices? Like you know, point and click versus actually building you know, capabilities in the code itself so that you can kind of build out these uh, aspects as a part of the process. Yeah, no, we have an amazing data analytics team here in the first line here uh, in the line of in, in technology and operations, and and they're 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 taking the leadership on kind of these various uh, vendor solutions that help, uh, and because ultimately the responsibility of the model developers need to make sure that they're doing the right testing on their models, and we come in as the assurance function as the second line. Um, but for us, yeah, most of those decisions on uh, on solutions model risks at the table, we're an important voice, we're an advisory voice, we're a consulting voice, our, our voice carries a lot of weight, but the final decision there is with the line of business and they're always evaluating different solutions to help on model explainability and model interpretability, on transparency, and of course that matters a lot to us mm -hmm. um, and we provide our insights and you know we give feedback on different vendors and so forth. Oh, a question came in about SR117, do we, uh, you know, something do I, uh, do we require vendors, or in the chat maybe, um, yeah. do we have potential vendors to provide attestation or proof that their models have been validated to SR117 standards? No, that's what we do. We're, we're, we're the, uh, I don't think we'd rely on their attestation or proof. They could be making it up. We perform those validations, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, how do you see the standards evolve over time, Jacob? I know there's been a lot of discussion with uh, this and some of the federal RFIs which uh, were out and also the European Union's AI regulations. Um, do, um, do you kind of foresee that there's a regulation first wherein you get the regulations and then you adhere to it or uh, is self-policing and kind of building out the infrastructure needs to happen first and then you have some aspects of it regulated. So what, what, where do you kind of see the, the crystal ball from here? Right. So I would say there's only three and a half minutes left. That's definitely a session. We should have a, a follow-up <laughs> session. Um, but I'd love to have you back. And I can kind of yeah, I'd love to. I put this one on the false code, in the false code, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I think in, in most, the short answer, I think in most modern model risk management teams, they're already doing everything that I see potentially being discussed in the RFIs, right? So whether it's the NIST or it's uh, others, uh, when we see this guidance coming out in the U.S. or from the European Union or our various, you know, requests for comment, requests for information, uh, when I look at kind of what's out there, most model risk teams at, you know, banks above $100 billion are already following most of this. Not all, but most of it. So wherever that regulation lands, I, I'm very confident that model risk teams are already kind of ahead of this. 
Um, but um, yeah. But I'm happy to chat with it more later at a future session. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, we have a lot of people in the audience who are taking courses uh, on modern risk management, algorithmic auditing, um, machine yeah. learning technology. So some of them are transitioning from other roles to machine learning related roles. Some right. of them are you know, embarking on becoming modern risk management professionals by understanding the process. So this has been very helpful. So what you right. know, you've kind of led teams on the development side and also on the modern risk management side. Um, two questions. One, what excites you the most, especially in the model risk management world? Um, and the second question is, how do you chalk out, you know, for an early uh, career professional, you know, how should they be thinking about their careers as model risk management professionals? Yeah, great question. So on the skills, we, we think about our skill set here. 50% of what we look for in associates whether we're hiring or promoting or making the managers, or what we call essential skills, collaborativeness, you know, positivity, strong writing skills, strong communication skills, um, wanting to help others, timeliness, that's 50%. So I do wanna make sure uh, prioritization is a big deal. You know, if a manager gives you A, B, and C to work on, and you say you have to have it done by the end of the month, and it'll take more than a month to do A, B, and C, are you good at challenging your manager and saying, oh, A, B, and C will take more than a month. Uh, I can do A and B on time or B and C or A and C, or D is really important. Have you thought of that? And having those conversations. So I think practicing those conversations of, of how to kind of have a, effective communications with your manager, figuring out prioritization, that's probably half those skills. The other half, really, we call the hard skills. So a third of that is subject matter expertise. If you're building credit models, do you understand credit risk? If you're building market risk models, do you understand market risk? That's a third. And so one thing I'd recommend there is to get an FRM. If you're doing any modeling in a bank that's called a financial risk management certification, um, that's extremely important to us. Or a PRM. Um, or I'll say it again, what's the other one? Or, or a PRM, professional risk yeah. manager. Yeah. Yes, that'd be great too. Yes, yes. Good call. <laughs> um, yes. So they get us some a certification to show you really know the subject matter expertise. CFAs are fine as well. And those are, are looked upon very highly. And then the second is the technology, right? Do you know Python? Do you know what's in front of the screen here? Um, do you have those technology skills that are on the screen right now? And third, your math and statistics skills. So I'd say one six is math and stats. One six is what you see on the screen. One six is you know your subject matter expertise and wherever you're building your models. And then that's the half. And then the other half is you know timeliness and um, collaborativeness and creativity and you know kind of good uh, you know good essential skills. Mm -hmm. That was Absolutely. your question about what people should focus on. You had a second question. What was the other one? Yeah, so the the, the career path. How do you chalk out a career path for an early career professional? in the model risk management world, with so much change is happening in the world. Yeah, people go everywhere. I mean, people from model risk here at Regions have gone on to lead LIBOR, have gone in the corporate bank, have gone in the consumer bank, have gone into um, credit risk management, have gone into technology. And so um, at your firm, try to build relationships. I know that's an important part of getting your job done. It's not just the skills, it's building that trusting relationship. Uh, and yeah, use your manager as, um, as hopefully as, as somebody who can kind of be your uh, your career architect with you, who can be kind of like your talent agent and kind of work with your manager to help support you in your career development. I mean, in our case, most people in model risk uh, regions work for about two to three years in model risk regions. Um, for us, we hire a lot of mid-career people, right? People who come over from credit and other areas, work for us for a few years, go back out in other parts of the bank. Um, so one is understand what you want to do next and work with your manager. And if your manager isn't somebody who's so into internal mobility, maybe you work with a mentor, um, but just kind of everyone's different. Some people end up, you know, running capital markets, some end up being data scientists, some end up, uh, you know, running interest rate risk. So everyone really has a different path. Model risk is really that amazing place where you get to see all the models of the bank, you get to see all the analytical processes of the bank, you get to develop strong technical skills, you get to learn subject matter expertise, your validations, you get to meet everybody, 
You get to understand how everything comes together. You get to see lagging practices and best practices. So from a career point of view, if you're going to be a data, there's two data scientists. One did 10 years as a data scientist, and one did eight years as a data scientist and two years in model risk. The person with the eight and the two is going to do a lot better than the 10 and the zero. So, um, yeah, so for most careers, and I think the way the bank AI risk is becoming more important for the future and analytics is more important for the future, um, I'd recommend everybody, uh, if able to, if you can pass the interviews, to work for two to three years in your career in model risk. I mean, you don't have to do it for five, you don't have to do it for 10, you don't have to do it for 20. Um, but for us, most, most associates have some bank experience somewhere, they work for us for two to three years, and then they move on to another part of banking. Uh, and, and that's a, a really successful career path I've seen a lot of here. Well, perfect. So with that, uh, we're gonna conclude today's session. Jacob, this was an excellent session. I loved all the examples and all the rich material you've shared with us today. And uh, uh, for people in the audience, if you want to join us uh, for the next Quant University session, so Jacob, I'm just going to make a quick screen share. Um, yep. so next week, we are taking a quick break. And on August the 31st, we have explanatory model analysis. And Prasmalev uh, Vaisek from the Warsaw University has been working on various explanatory techniques in the AI and machine learning world. So you will see a session uh, from his group. And uh, on September 7th, we have a session on model exchange and that's hosted by uh, the LFAI and uh, that's a hosted project of the LFAI. And uh, Christian and Tommy from IBM are gonna be presenting, uh, talking about data catalogs and model catalogs, primarily from an MLOps perspective, they're building out a whole open source platform. So we'll talk about that particular project. So I hope you're gonna join us in those sessions and uh, this was an absolute pleasure. Again, Jacob, thank you for making time for us. And uh, we'll catch up uh, on the discussions for the next session and uh, we'll continue from there. Great, well, thank you for having me, Sri. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Take care. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. See you. Thanks, everyone.